Ladies and gents, welcome to Wrestling Changed My Life. You're listening to episode 96 with Mark Ironside. I'm not thinking about winning. Um, I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking. You know about the crowd. I'm not thinking that I'm wrestling Kerry Cola. All I'm doing is thinking about and the same thing. I I always thought about my entire life. Anytime I was ever on the mat wrestling, I, I'm just thinking about scoring. That's all I'm ever thinking about in my mind. We can endure anything, and adapt, and pivot, and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back from our travels. Thank you so much for tuning in. We were in Cedar Rapids, Cedar Falls, and Iowa City last week doing a ton of interviews and also putting on our happy hour before the Iowa-Penn State duel, which, what a duel that was. Good Lord. Probably the best dual meet I've ever been to. So thank you all who came out to the happy hour. I think we're going to do them at each event the podcast goes to this year, which includes the Big Tens, the NCAAs, and Olympic trials. So keep an eye out for that. And in the meantime, let's get to the interview with one of the great college wrestlers of all time, Mark Ironside, Hodge Trophy winner, two-time national champ for Gable and Zaleski in the late 90s. Before we get to the interview, fan of the week goes to Jim Couples. He's the CEO of AgCheck an Oregon duck, and a diehard listener of the show. So thank you very much, Jim. As always, folks, this episode is brought to you by our online store. You can go to store.wrestlingchangeofmylife.com for t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, stickers. If you want to support the podcast, that's the second best way to do so. The best way is to tell your friends about it. Tell your cousins, tell your kids, tell your coworkers about the Wrestling Change My Life podcast. The best place to send them is our website, WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Now that's it, folks. Let's give it up for Mark Ironside. Peace. We are in wrestling country. Mark Ironside, Iowa, Penn State tomorrow. Before we get on your career, let's let's just talk about this team. And does it remind you of some of those old Gable teams where you had just the crazy buy-in with all the guys? Yeah, it really does. You know, um, I was just mentioning something that. Um, to my daughters the other day they're big eye wrestling fans and go to all the meets that they're able to go to um how fun it is to go to these meets and just know that you're gonna win it's just a question of pretty much how bad are you gonna win you know you know what's the what's the margin gonna be like and um you know doing the radio commentary for the eye wrestling team i travel with the team um i'm on the bus rides and so forth or whatever and just being around the guys you can tell that they're a very tight-knit um, group of guys. Uh, they hang out a lot together. They all live together right across the road um, from Carver Hawk Arena um, in a set of apartments over there. And uh, um, and fans have even noticed too, like when you go to the meets, like when somebody's wrestling, uh, like the whole entire team is up off the bench a lot of times, staying there screaming and yelling. And the, and the really cool thing is if you take a, and a perfect example of it is at 184, you got Abe Asad, the new, uh, just pulled his red shirt here a couple of weeks ago. And um, one of the biggest, you know, supporters of him is Cash Wilkie, uh, standing up and yelling for him as well too. And that's what's awesome. Everybody knows their role on the team. Um, and then if one man's down, the next man in is ready to go as well too, which is awesome to see. And they all seem like really good kids too, like Lee and Cameron, like you know, kids that you'd want your son to grow up and be like. For sure, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of them don't drink alcohol at all. No right. college kids really should anyway because they're not of age. But you know, all know how you know that is in college <laughs> and so forth. But um, you know, they stay away from that stuff, and uh, they're very, very driven. 
Um, they literally live in the wrestling room. And when I say that, it's not, they don't live in there like, um, it's just, rawr, just getting after it all the time, but they just like to go. That's like, they, they like to hang out in there. They like to be in there. And, um, and if they're not, they're just, they're just across the street and they like to do a lot of different things together, you know, have nights at certain people's houses and, um, uh, get togethers and stuff like that instead of going downtown and, and hanging out and having that social life and staying They do a really good job of staying away from, you know, that type of atmosphere. And it's not like they have to work hard at staying with it. They just don't really care for it or need to, uh, which is absolutely awesome to see. Yeah, you don't even see, like, you don't even think that they're even close to that lifestyle, you know? No, they're it, not. It's so different from, you look at the Iowa teams of the 80s, you had kind of the work hard, play hard, Roy Salinger, and then Steiners and Brands get in the early 90s, and you come in, you know, was Brands your coach and kind of your guy when you got to the Iowa program in the early 90s? I was very, um, very uh, lucky um, to have Tom and Terry in the wrestling room uh, when I came to Iowa, uh, I benefited them from a lot, from a coaching standpoint and also from a workout partner standpoint, because they were training for the Worlds and the Olympics at that time. So they were they were they were coaching, but they were also on the mat every single day. Mm -hmm. So I benefited a lot from having them as workout partners, um, and then also as coaches as well too. Um, both so on and off the mat they just taught me a lot I, I kind of they were kind of like my mentors when I was in high school that's what I kind of you know directed myself after kind of epitomized myself after I, I wanted to follow in their footsteps I grew up in Cedar Rapids uh, which is 25 miles down the road from Iowa City so any had any opportunity I ever had to get down to Iowa City watch one um, live in Carver Hawkeye Arena I was there and if not then we were you know my brother and I we would tape the matches on VHS at the time on Iowa Public Television and we would rewatch those matches over and over and over again, literally until you're like wearing out the VHS tapes. <laughs> um, you would pause something and, and and hit it in slow motion. I studied everything that they did, and um, you know those guys. They didn't drink alcohol. I didn't drink alcohol. I just I really looked up to those guys a lot, and just a lot of it just their training methods, their ferociousness on the mat. Yeah. But then you get them off the mat, and that's what a lot of people don't realize um, is that they are very. Uh, level head down to earth just just you couldn't ask for more loyal individuals ever than Tom and Terry Brands they're going to be right there for you uh, just the nicest guys tons tons of fun to hang around with uh, great personalities um, so how they are on the mat isn't exactly how they are off the mat right and it seems like even the Steiners they didn't drink so that whole kind of clan of the early and mid 90s was just clean living like that in that new era that that Gable had ushered in do you think it was something he consciously did to start recruiting guys that lived that lifestyle or it just kind of happened that way? I don't know. That'd be a great question for Coach Gable himself. I, I Honestly, I don't know. It may have just happened that way or honestly, after Brad Penrith, Roy Salger, and some others went through there, Gable might have said, you know what? <laughs> it might be time now to start changing some things up a little bit. Times are changing, um, you know, and uh, those guys did what those guys did. And I mean, like, you know, back in the day of, of Royce and Penrith and, and a lot of others, you could get away with it back then. Yeah. Uh, they played hard and they worked hard. And, uh, but I also think though, after going for, I think it was the ninth championship in so a row. So they won nine, they lost 10th and 87. Yeah. Lost yeah. that 10th one. I think that was kind of a wake up call. Yeah. Um, I think maybe coach Gable after that really kind of started directing things a little bit differently, you know, and changing some things up and, um, I think that's when you probably saw the, the page start turning a little bit and things start changing, um, you know, kind of how they handle themselves socially and so forth. And was Gable someone who was actively coaching at that time? Because I know he had the hip replacement. And so what I mean by coaching is on the recruiting trip, did he come in your living room or was it Brands and Zaleski? And was Gable more like CEO at that point? No, when I when I was recruited, I was recruited in full force by um, – Coach Gable and, and Jim Zaleski at that time, okay, uh, which would have been in 1993, my senior year of high school. Coach Gable and, and Jim Zaleski came to the house. Um, they're the ones that came in. We signed the papers. I didn't do a big thing at the school, which they didn't really do that stuff back then, like what they do now, make yeah. a big deal of it back then. But um, even if they did, I probably would have done it. I remember the day that I got recruited and not recruited, but signed the actual papers. Um, we My family would run a big trap line and uh, we ran traps that morning. We got back in time to make sure that we were there for Coach uh, Gable and Zaleski <laughs> to come over. And um, we just did it at the kitchen table uh, at our house. And I remember Gable coming into the garage that day. And, you know, we had caught a couple of fox that morning and raccoons and all kinds of different <laughs> stuff. And he was just in awe of, like, I can, and I, I just remember him just think, sitting there thinking, 
I didn't know these things were actually real. I mean, I hear people talk about foxes, but he'd never actually <laughs> seen one in person, you know? So what is a trap line? Like, what does that mean? A trap line? Yeah. Uh, you know, you just got like miles and miles of, of different territories that you trap, you know, you're setting a lot of iron and, um, you know, we ran a lot, probably over 500 traps. My dad, my dad did, and he would take off two weeks off of work. Back then the prices were worth, the fur prices were a lot higher than what they are now. Okay. And they, so they're worth a lot more. And, and he had a factory job and, and he would take two weeks off the first two weeks in November every year, and then he would make more money trapping than he would if he was actually at work. Um, and then wow. he got a lot of free labor out of my brother and I as well, too. So <laughs> that helped as well. And it wasn't just set, setting the traps, but getting up early in the mornings and running them all and uh, checking them and then um, coming coming back home. And that's when the real work began in the garage because you got all the skinning and the fleshing and the stretching. And um, then you're up until you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and back up by 4 a.m. the next morning doing it all over again. So, so you... You go do that. You get back. Gables at the house, and you're skinning foxes and whatnot as you're signing your letter of intent. Well, we weren't. We didn't. We just gotten back. We didn't have time to start the skinning process quite then. But I know that like when they were starting to leave, he wanted to see that process. So then <laughs> once he was leaving, we we started skinning out, skinning them out a little bit, and he was he was. It was pretty interesting. He never seen anything like that before. Man, well, he was pretty <clears throat> single minded. You know, single mindedly focused back in his day. So maybe he didn't even get out for that. But what I hear is that you kind of use that as a workout. Oh, it was a, definitely a workout. There's a lot of things that um, I, I was very fortunate to have in my life to where I was training but not really training. I didn't know I was training. And just um, with the upbringing that I had with my dad <clears throat> and the things that uh, we would do back then. But trapping was a, it was a big workout, carrying all these, you know, uh, number ones, wired long re-rods up and down the banks from the time that, you know, I was seven or eight years old. And um, just climbing up and down all those banks, walking up and down the creeks and, and against the current and all that water and stuff, and um, and you had to walk miles too. I mean, if it was if the if the ground was wet and you couldn't drive in the fields or whatever, and um, the things that you, you look back on that you know, especially my brother and I did, were just uh, crazy. That you just wouldn't even think that uh, of people, you know, never even thinking about doing these days. Which back then we didn't even think twice about. It. We just thought that's kind of the way how it was, you know. And uh, but yeah, we were getting great workouts in. And so if we weren't in the wrestling room, we were outside doing something like that where we're getting even more exercise. But those were that's what we did on our on our days off. When I've heard you say that kids now are in the room more, <clears throat> you were in the room less at that age, but you did more working out outside the room and getting creative and, and doing all kinds of like crazy workouts like that what are some examples of of things you remember with you and your brother in high school that were just kind of you thought were pushing the extreme a little bit well you know you make a good point kids are in the probably in the rooms more these days and, and that's for a couple of reasons one they're not as creative to go outside they don't have to when they were growing up they got they, they all have phones um video games they have all that you guys hear all the whole song and dance everybody right. talks about it but it's a true it's a true statement you know i mean if you take away all these kids phones because i mean when we were growing up we didn't have them they, they didn't even exist so um, it's not like just, you know, the rich kids had them or anything like that. They did not exist. So it's kind of funny. I just had this conversation with my daughter the other day, my youngest one, who's in eighth grade. And uh, I was like, you know, because her and I, for a workout the other day, I took her out in my backyard, which we have a big hill, and it was a lot of snow on the ground. Um, and the snow was, um, it was wet. And we put on some big, heavy-duty rubber boots, thin slated boots, and um, we ran hills back there. And and I was like, you know, back in the day, like that's that's what we did, like you know, for workouts. Like I used to go over. I lived in Cedar Rapids uh, and grew up, and there was a big hill called Jones Park where it was a big sledding hill. It was a really, really tall, big hill. Yeah. And I had a paper route every morning, which is one of the things that my brother and I would do for a workout. We would be up at 5 a.m. every morning because the papers had delivered by six. And so we each throw a, a heavy bag of papers on. We go from door to door, and we had a route around our a uh, couple blocks around our house. And we wouldn't just walk from house to house, but we would literally sprint. It was almost like a race. He'd have one side of the street, and I'd have one side of the street. And it didn't matter. I mean, that's the thing. Just like the mail, you know, you deliver the paper 365 days a year. It didn't matter. Rain, snow, sleet, whatever. Yep. It didn't matter how steep the snow was. It, d it did not matter. Those papers needed to be delivered by 6 a.m. And it, we didn't do it really for so much the competition aspect of it to sprint and, and get it done but it was almost like a race kind of but we just wanted to hurry up and get it done we it wasn't fun we just wanted to be done so hey the fastest way to get it done is to run so we just we just ran right but you know some of the other things that do would be like you know i would get done with my paper out every morning when i was in high school and i did it for seven years straight um 
uh, I would throw if it was, you know, zero degrees out and it was snowing and like it'd be like a blizzard. I would throw heavy duty coveralls on and I had a four and a half mile route that I would run and I'd go and throw all that stuff on or, um, and run that route. If it was summertime out and it was 95 degrees out just to kind of push myself a little bit more and make it a little bit tough or whatever, I would throw um, five pound ankle weights on. So and go run it with ankle weights. There's just things that I did that my dad never told me, hey, here's what you should do. You should go do this. I, I guess that's where, you know, I didn't have all the natural ability in the world. I'm not no Jordan Burroughs or anything like that. And that's not a knock on Jordan Burroughs because the, the amazing thing about Jordan Burroughs is he has so much ability, but yet he has a work ethic to go with it. And that's what makes him a special and very unique individual. Um, so I basically, I didn't have a lot of that. So I had to make up for it, you know, with mental toughness, physical conditioning. And then as my career went on through high school and, and, and college, I was able to develop a lot of good skill sets and so forth to, to kind of go with it. But I was always trying to be creative um, in my workouts and, and, and want to change ways of, of getting better, you know, and without being in the wrestling room every day. And I think that's one thing that <clears throat> our society, we really uh, are probably too much of anymore is because I go back to the phone thing. Well, People aren't, as a young age, they're not out doing different things. They didn't go out and play. Like when I was a kid, we lived at the park that was over there by. We were never home. Our parents never knew where we were at. <laughs> but we were never, ever, ever in the house. We were always gone doing something. Um, you know, so we we're outside getting exercise, using our brains and, and being creative, making up games and or going playing stickball and, and recreating things and using your imagination. And now everything is so directed. I mean, look at you sports. I mean, these kids are playing in baseball tournaments, softball tournaments, basketball tournaments. It doesn't matter the sport all over the place, but it's all organized. None of it is created amongst the kids just meeting up at, you know, cause they didn't, we had telephones that were hooked to a wall, but you just met up at the park or in a sandlot that day um at say typical time common time was like you know 11 o'clock and whoever showed up we picked teams and we went and played um so going back to that is what they do now is that everything is so organized that they're basically life that is run for them mm -hmm. and if they get in a situation where they're kind of on their own they're bored. They're, they don't know what to do. So what do they do? They sit on their phones. So it, to work out, they need equipment. They need to go in the room. They have to have a treadmill. Well, there wasn't even treadmills back then. If they did, I was never around one. You know, there were stationary bikes and so forth, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where you go in and you, you have, so everybody has the best of the best equipment right now and the, and the nice facilities and stuff. And so I think having the opportunity that I did to go out and outside of the wrestling room and get workouts in. Sometimes it was a workout, sometimes an actual workout. Sometimes I was getting a workout in, but it, to me it was fun whatever we were doing, whether it be even going a couple miles from my house, walking to these ponds to catch some bluegills that we'd use for bait and having to carry a five-gallon bucket full of water in each arm all the way home like a mile full of water and having to set them down every once in a while to rest or my brother and I would take turns. And I mean, you're getting a workout in and, and it's in your forms, it's in your grip without even knowing your shoulders. And that's how it was. But um, now they... You, you have to go in, basically to get a workout in, you have to go into a facility. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, if it's wrestling, you go into a wrestling room. You know, if it's basketball, you go into a gym. Um, you, you know, and then you can work on skill sets. But I am a firm believer in you can spend too much time in the in a, an actual room or, or, or wrestling environment to where if you step out of that and you get workouts in outside of that, and then you come back to it, you're actually more mentally fresh and mentally focused, and you're going to get better quality workouts in once you get back there than if you're just in there every every single day and it's just kind of monotonous and you're going end up going through the motions and you're really not getting a lot out of it. But with that being said, even when you are in there, you still have to you know mix up your workouts and get creative in your lifting and creative mm -hmm. in your in your conditioning workouts get, you know coaches get creative in how they're putting you know the the guys through through workouts every day in the room it can't just be that same old thing all the time yeah and it, to your point it gets you more excited to compete when you're not in there all the time right and you, for sure you, you're more grateful for those opportunities absolutely that's exactly what i'm saying yep so when you getting back to your college days you know you get in the lineup <clears> at iowa and the match that everyone talks about that I've seen a hundred times is you versus Colat. Um, what year were you when that happened? Sophomore. That was 1996. You, had you wrestled him at that Never point? Never before, no. So 
It's the All Star in Iowa City, right? Yes. Okay, so I was I didn't think I would dual dock Haven a lot, and so it's at Carver, the All Star meet, which I wish they still did. Um, so you get out there. What do you remember from your first minute or two going with him? Because he got an early lead and you ended up coming back and winning, but he had like a very unique style. He was kind of jab stepping in the whole time. Was it a unique feel? Um, I don't really remember the the feel. I just remember the pace being fast. Um. You know, when when you're wrestling, you're not really thinking. It's just more acting and reacting, you know, the whole entire time. I just remember the pace being fast, which is the way that I wanted it. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I kind of had going for me was the fact that um, I was conditioned. I had, you know, I was ranked number two in the country undefeated at the time. He was ranked number one in the country undefeated at the time. But, you know, he had never even gone out of the first period at that point. So he had never really been pushed past – two three minutes ever you know let alone at carver what's that let alone at carver with yeah the energy for sure there. with with all the you know the fans there and the energy and and everything else goes with it and then the thing that i kind of really saw is i saw him um in the uh wrestling room that day because everybody's warming up at the same time and and carrie you know and I, I really looked up to carrie and i knew about his credentials i knew who he was i knew what he did and um i respected the heck out of him still do to this day uh, but he didn't really warm up very much, and I was getting a really good hard physical warm up in with Bill Zadek, like what I always do and stuff. And I saw Kerry finally come out of the out of the bleachers that day and hit a few shots, go into the weight room, do a few pull ups, and that was really about it. And um, knowing that, I saw that two things: one, he's he's not really he's thinking it's pretty much going to be an easy match, mm -hmm. you know, not really give me the respect maybe that um, I thought I deserved at the time or whatever. The other thing too is, you know. By doing that, you're not really getting your the, the your weight. You're not really getting your muscles and, and the oxygen going through your muscles. You're not getting really warmed up. So once you go out there, all of a sudden you're gonna be like go hard and fast right away, and you're just gonna be like <gasps> you're gonna hit like a wall. And I knew if I pushed that pace, so that was kind of my game plan the whole entire time. What I really needed to stay away from is what Coach Gable worked on me the week of. We didn't even think about Kerry Colot until it was time for Kerry Colot. One thing that we worked a lot in the room was defending his front headlock, mm -hmm. and he had a really good front headlock. And and I know that I hit um, quite a few shots early in that match, but just could not finish. He had the trick knee. Kerry was kind of like the first one to start kind of coming up with this trick knee stuff. And, and I, I had never felt that before. I never experienced that before. Um, so I really didn't know. I was kind of slow at reacting to it. And they kept going to stalemates or we'd come out of it back up in the neutral position. But I was taking some shots, and he got me in that front headlock once. And I just remember I got to clear, I got to clear, I got to clear. And I ended up clearing out of there. And I think once I cleared out of there that first time, um, that really benefited me. But, man, did he hit me with an explosive double and took me right off of my feet. Um, and I knew right then and there that it was – this was this this guy was wrestling. He's he's not your normal um, – just your normal wrestler, everyday wrestler by any means. I mean, the kid was a stud. Well, it's rare that two guys go out there who really believe they can win and they're ready to push it to the absolute limit. I mean, I've heard you say you're not afraid to get tired. You know, Colat wasn't afraid to get tired. So when you took guys go out there, you know you're going to go into dark waters – um, if you want to win, you know, most of the time. And at, at, in the third period with a minute 30 left, you were down 6-3, then you get a takedown, then you get another takedown, and then with 40 seconds left, you cut him. Gable's going crazy, the crowd's going crazy, and then you get a go behind and end up winning 8-7. At any point in that, are you ever kind of doubting yourself when you're down 6-3 late in the match? Well, the last takedown wasn't a go behind, actually. It was off of a shot. The okay. second one in the third period, there was a go behind. He had taken a shot, kind of a bad shot, right. got his head down, and I hit a go behind. The next one, after I cut him, was actually a single leg, the same single that I'd been getting it on from a non-tie um, and on his trick knee. Now, two things there. One... He, would, he was tired, so his reflexes weren't quite the same, so he wasn't able to trick that knee out and cut that corner like what he's wanting to do quite as fast. Two, I'd already been in that position, I don't know, three three times or so in the match, so I kind of knew what he was going to do, and I was making this adjustment right away. Once I got in there, I knew I had to get to that far ankle a lot quicker. I had to cut that corner a lot quicker, and I just barely, barely, barely got my fingertips on that far ankle just enough to where I could prevent him from being able to trick that knee out, and it still wasn't a give-me takedown. I still had to work for it, but you know, finally finally got that takedown, and once I got the takedown, um, I don't even remember how much time was there. There might have been like 20 seconds left that we still had to ride him. He did get to his feet. Um, I was trying to pressure forward so we wouldn't come up, but he, he, you know, he had enough energy obviously left to get him up to his feet, but I put him back down again, and then it was um, pretty much over. So, I mean, going back to that match, it's one of those things where I'm not thinking about winning. Um, I'm not thinking 
I'm not thinking, you know, about the crowd. I'm not thinking that I'm wrestling Kerry Cola. All I'm doing is thinking about and the same thing I, I always thought about my entire life. Anytime I was ever on the mat wrestling. Uh, it's when I talk about kids, you know, when I do camps and clinics and speaking uh, deals these days to wrestling schools and motivational talks, blah, 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 um, is I, I'm just thinking about scorn. That's all I'm ever thinking about in my mind is just scorn. I got to get to the leg. I got to get to the leg. And I got to get to the leg. And I got to score. I got to score. I got to cut the corner. I got, you know, you're, my mind's racing 100 miles an hour. Um, and that's why. And then if you're thinking about scoring, um, then winning will take care of itself. And then even if you're ahead by, you know, one or two points, and I try to win by as, you know, as large of a margin as I always possibly could. But if you're ahead by one or two points and all you're thinking about is winning, that's when people shut down. That's when they stop wrestling. Okay, I, I'm winning right now. I can co start coasting a little bit. And that's when they get themselves in trouble. Nothing should change. Once you get that one or two point lead, you still focused on scoring, 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 scoring. And you had that discipline, even in deep matches like that, where you wouldn't you wouldn't think about holding on to a lead. You were just thinking about scoring and, and, and pushing as hard as you could. Yes. And unfortunately for me, early on in my career especially, I fell behind early in a lot of matches. So I didn't really have a choice but to think about scoring because I had to score if I even if I wanted to win. <laughs> you know, but um even though even even once you did get the lead you continue to stay offensive and you t you know in a smart manner and you continue to you know to keep scoring and when i say scoring i'm not talking about shooting 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 i'm talking about hand fighting you know getting two on one getting angles controlling the elbow snapping the head pulling pushing and and creating angles and there's a lot to be said for moving your hands, moving your feet. Those are all methods of scoring. You're not scoring points, but you're setting yourself up to score points. Mm -hmm. Nothing should ever really be idle when you're wrestling. Um, so when I say I'm always thinking about scoring, I'm thinking about the you know, the, the, the final score, but to get there, there's so much that go that needs to be done before you actually pull the trigger, hit that shot, and then hit your finish. Well, and plus you think about you know, the match is only seven minutes. You had gone so much harder in the practice room with guys like Tom, Terry, McGinnis. I mean, you had push the wall back every day in those Iowa rooms and, leading up to that. And that's that's where I really benefited from having Tom and Terry um, as workout partners every single day. I, 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 I couldn't have gone... I couldn't have graduated from high school and gone into the Iowa wrestling room, honestly, at a better time ever in, in, in my career. Right. Uh, to be able to have the opportunity to go in there and wrestle Tom and Terry Brands pretty much every single day. I mean, you got to remember, there was two of them, not just one of them. So if I wasn't wrestling with Tom, it seemed like I was wrestling with Terry. And it was almost like a leapfrog. It seemed like from that, that first year that I was in the room, wrestling almost every day. And I remember Gable actually coming up to me one day and said, hey, you need to start wrestling with some people that you can actually get in on their legs and actually score some points on and i'm like i know trust me <laughs> okay that'd be nice for me too but they ask me like every day hey you want to be my partner or they don't really ask they just say hey i'm gonna go with you day and i'm like what am i supposed to tell them no and i had this conversation with gable and gable was like i'll take care of that you just work on finding other partners i'm like okay so it went down from like four to five days a week to where now i'm only wrestling with them like you know two three max four days a week still wrestle with them every day but when I went, came out of high school, I mean, there were so many practices that I would never score a point. I mean, not even come close to scoring a point. Couldn't get to their legs. Couldn't finish. Um, you know, where I was good at with my brawling, hand fighting, they were, you know, they were 10 times better. Um, so they were beating me where I was good. So, again, I had to get very creative in my wrestling, figuring out ways how to get to their legs and, and be a lot quicker and better at finishing. Um, so how, it's kind of funny how I always tell people is that they took my level of wrestling from, like, you know, level D up to like level B plus in so fast that when, and going back to the carry cola match, when I kind of where you were alluding to, I was wrestling with those guys every day. So then when I go out on the mat and I'm wrestling collegiate opponents, it was truly like a vacation to me. I mean, <laughs> it, it really was. It was like when you go from wrestling Tom and Terry brands repeatedly every single week to, you know, wrestling college guys, it was just hallelujah. I cannot wait for Friday night or Sunday to get here fast enough so <laughs> I can have like, a, it was like a day off for me. God. You know? Everyone from that era says that. McElravey said that because, you know, when he'd go against Joe Williams every day, he's like, that's two Olympians going at it. And, like, you think about the Brains brothers. They were out of college. But even your lineup was crazy. You had McGinnis. You had Whitmer. You had McElravey. I mean, did you ever scrap with McElravey or was he too big? No, I scrapped with McElravey. Not not often, but I we scrapped um, – 
you know, probably five, six times a year, I suppose. Yeah. Um, he was two weight classes bigger. Uh, I would even go and wrestle with Joe Williams once in a while. Um, go up to the 167 pound and wrestle Joe Williams. I just wanted that different feel. Yeah. I wanted to feel someone different. I wanted to challenge myself. Um, I, I'd like to wrestle. I never really wrestled Whitmer too much because he was a lot smaller. I wrestled men a little bit because uh, he was smaller than me. Um, I it could physically just kind of throw him around or whatever. But the thing I wrestled about men was he was so stinking quick. He mm. was lightning fast. And it was good for me to be able to really have to concentrate on moving my feet. Or if I hit a shot, I had it had to be so quick and so crisp because those feet of his will be gone. He was, so you just try to wrestle with different partners on a regular basis all the time to change things up a little bit. And that was where I was very blessed to be in the iWrestling room because you could get so many different looks yeah. from so many different people and not just taking the easy road and wrestling with like a walk-on every day or anything like that. Even when I wasn't wrestling Tom and Terry Brands, it's just like what you said with Lincoln McGravy. You know, there's days I'm wrestling Jeff McGinnis, I'm wrestling Bill Zadick, I'm wrestling Mike Mena, and then there's other guys too. Or I might go up and wrestle Joe or Lincoln. I mean, even if I wasn't wrestling Tom and Terry, it seemed like I, very seldom did I ever have a day to where it was, you know, a walk on or someone that really wasn't that good and you could just light them up, you know, not very often did, did, did that happen, nor did I really want it to happen. So I was very into wrestling pretty much every single day up to competition. I didn't really back off a whole lot. So like the day before competition, Gable would kind of turn us loose to let's do whatever we wanted on our own. I still wanted to wrestle live, but that's when I would grab someone that I could be in control of and not have to worry about getting hurt or expending a ton, a ton of energy. And my goal that day would be, okay, I'm going to hit, I'm going to get 25 takedowns. As soon as I get 25 takedowns, I'm good. You know, or I might score, you know, my, my goal today is hit on this shot. Right, and this guy right here, I, the guy I'm coming up, he leads left leg. I'm gonna, I want to hit, I want to hit 20 sweeps. I want to score 20 sweeps to the guy's left side. So that's my goal that day or whatever. You just kind of, you know, get creative like what we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. and you kind of match it up with what, what you have up and coming that week. That's who I picked for workout partners. If I'm wrestling a really good legger coming up I'm pick, or someone that's really good at scrambling and um, he's very flexible, Jeff McGinnis is your man. You know, if I'm wrestling someone just really strong, really powerful, unbelievably good hips, that's where I might go wrestle Lincoln McGravy. Lincoln McGravy, I could have him in a double leg up on my shoulders and I couldn't <laughs> score. I mean, the guy's hips were in balance. Was just it was phenomenal. It was just it was insane. It just I've never wrestled anybody that had hips in balance like what he had. Now you talk about a unique feel. I'm gonna bring up a name that I know you know. Semis your sophomore year, St. John. Have you ever felt someone on top with that chokehold that he not chokehold, but that three quarter? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking what the about. Heck was and, that? and now it's illegal. It looked illegal. It's, at it's the time. an immediate stall call. So right. uh, basically after that year, um, they, they tried to change the rules. At that point in time, there was no fleeing the match. Had he been hit for stalling? And it, in that match, you can't see the ref or the warnings, but you're freaking all over the guy. He's fleeing the match. Did, did it, any stall calls in that match? Yes, no? I did finally get one stall call somewhere in that match, probably obviously late in the third period. But there was a lot of times I ended on shots on the edge of the mat right there. Um, the rules have changed so much. Um, it's kind of funny um, if, if you – the rules have changed so much. Like if, if someone backs out of bounds, it's a caution yep. and then points and so forth and fleeing the whole fleeing the mat used to be a, a call. Now I've kind of just gone to the cautions where you go out of bounds, um, coming over the top arm and head, uh, and just, it's now a stall, right? It's, it's immediate, immediate, um, caution right there for stalling. If it comes over head where it wasn't any of that before. Mm -hmm. So back then he got away with fleeing the mat, playing the edge, coming over and basically stalling his way through the match right there. Um, you know, and his, but he did take me down in overtime, hit got that. me caught reaching, hit a duck, and I went basically falling right over the top and got caught out of position reaching. Uh, but the, it, there's, there, you could get a buy with stalling a lot more back then than what you can now. Yeah. Um, uh, it was kind of funny that Kyle Kleeman actually, uh, or it was it Andy Hamilton, one of them's track players, and he contacted me and said they just rewatched that match. And if it would have been re, they rescored it, and if it would have been re wrestled with today's rules, I'd have won that match by like four or five points. Like, totally different match than, than what it would have been back then. So the sport has go, re evolved in a very good way, in a very good manner, to create more action and not allow guys to stall so much. Yeah, I was watching it Monday morning, getting ready for this, and I'm sitting at my apartment <clears> screaming. <throat> I'm getting into it, going crazy, because I didn't know the result of that one, because I knew you won two. I didn't know the year you didn't win. Um, and my neighbor's like, is everything okay up here? I'm like, I, you don't understand, but I'm watching a, a hose job in here. So obviously after the – and I bring it up because I want to know how you responded to the loss because you only lost three times in your last three years. So obviously you're visibly emotional on the mat. You come back to get third. How many days, weeks after are you using it to kind of get yourself back going again? 
Well, that was the last match. That was my sophomore year in the semifinals of nationals yep. um, in overtime. That was the last match I lost in my career in college. I never, I did not <laughs> lose again after that. And that match right there pushed me, I think, over the – that was the defining moment in my career. That moment pushed me over the edge um, that I, I basically – promised myself internally um, that I will never, ever, ever lose again. There was a picture I remember, um, I think it was in the Daily Iowan at the time, or I don't even remember where I for sure got it, of uh, when I lost that match, when I grabbed my clothes from Tom and I was running off the mat, and obviously I was very upset, and I hung that picture on my wall um, in the trailer that I lived in, in, in just outside of Iowa City. Uh, and I didn't just take it down after my first title. I mean, I, it was up until I moved. And um, it just it was just always a really good reminder. I never, ever, ever wanted to feel that again. And that's where um, I really wanted to work on the skill set in my wrestling. I wasn't mad because of the way the rules were and he was stalling or anything like that. I was mad because I couldn't get out from on the bottom. I allowed that guy to do that to me. I didn't have the hand control. I got in a lot of shots, didn't finish them. That's where my mind clicked and I said, I have to get better. I will get better and I will not get beat ever again. And um, and it just kind of really, really drove me uh, to do that. And I, I do remember we got back Sunday um, uh, that next day after the tournament, you know, it was on Saturday. We drove back to, um, um, from, from Minneapolis. It was up at the target center in Minneapolis. And I remember going right back, right into the room, right when we got back. And I, and I never, on never, Sunday, on Sunday, the second I got back, I started, there was nobody else around. I, I wanted to start working on getting better right then and there. So I grabbed an atom dummy, uh, or a drill dummy off the, uh, uh, along the wall, uh, throw dummy and just started drilling and hitting shots and, and hitting them hard and crisp and just, I mean, it just it just really kind of pushed me over the edge a little bit to do everything in, the, in my control to um, make sure that I never, ever felt that again. And you rode that all the way through. And what about your diet and, and kind of like your sleep? Were you thinking about that during your time at Iowa training, or was that really not as technically advanced scientifically as it is now in terms of the diet and the rest and recovery? Was it's, that focus for you? It absolutely. It has to be. I mean, if you're any good athlete, no matter what sport you're in, it has to be a focus. And I wish it was a little bit more of a focus. At the, I wish I had a little bit be more focused or more so I was more knowledge at the high school level. And I wish kids were these days. I wish nutritionists would go into high school wrestling rooms or coaches would be better knowledge themselves at the high school um, level. Or if they're not, then bring in a nutritionist and talk to the team. And not just at the beginning of the year one time but repeatedly throughout the year so it could instilled and instilled and instilled in their brains because nutrition is key. You have to be your optimal. And for you to be your optimal, um, you have to make sure you're putting the right things in your body on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And it, it just can't be uh, – it can't go, yeah, I'm re- I do really good for one day, and the next day it kind of goes south. You know, It has to be every single day and a routine. And if you're not doing it right, you're cheating yourself. And that's the great thing about sport of wrestling, probably more so than some other sports, is if you don't take care of your body nutritionally, it's going to show – in your weight cut, it's going to show, which is then going to show out on the mat. You can't hide it. Mm-hmm. You can't hide it. So you have to do it correctly, or it's going. The results are going to show out on the mat where it really, really counts. Some other sports you can kind of get away with that, especially team sports. You might have a bad day, bad game, whatever, and it can kind of be hidden over. When you're in wrestling, especially when it takes so much physicality and energy, your nutrition. Is, it has to be like the number one thing that you're concentrated on the most um, in a very good manner. But it's also, too, you got to go into practice feeling good. My main thing is never miss a meal. You can't miss ever, never, ever, ever miss a meal. Even if, when you're cutting. Even when you're cutting. Even, you know, if, if you're going to, if you get up, like, say we're going to go to Michigan State this Sunday, one o'clock dual meet, weighing at noon, the I wrestling team will be up at eight o'clock eating breakfast. Okay, the same morning they're going to be weighing in four hours from there, and they're still eating breakfast because that breakfast is what they're going to be wrestling on come one o'clock. And the other thing is, the way I look at it is, I never, I mean, who wants to go into weight cut feeling like dog crap? Right. You know, I mean, just feeling weak and feeling tired and just you know trying to get through it. It's just you're dragging or whatever. I wanted to go into those weight. Cut. I want to feel good. I'd rather go in there a little bit heavier like a pound or two heavier with having to lose an extra pound or two feeling good than maybe a pound or two less but feeling just absolutely terrible because you could get your sweat going you got energy you can get it going you feel good you can't 
you can't lose, miss a meal. You never skip a meal. But at the same time, your portions of the meals have to be, you have to be smart with your portions. And then what you're eating has to be, you know, um, obviously very important as well, too. Like the amount of sugar kids eat now and just the general dehydration, to your point, a nutritionist could solve a lot of that. Absolutely. And, it, and it's, 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 like I said, more so in the sport of wrestling, but even in, even in baseball, you know, kids going out in the heat and playing in the baseball and so forth, you know, and, you know, cutting out your sugars and your pop and, and stuff like that. Even Gatorade is so over pushed, you know, and it's so much sugar Full in Gatorade, sugar. just completely. It's just a gimmick. It's a marketing scheme. Um, you know, people don't even realize this, that Powerade is twice as good as better for you than Gatorade. It has half the sodium and twice the carbs. You're getting actually more out of Powerade, or twice as much more out of Powerade than you are Gatorade. Uh, but you can, you don't really need that stuff unless you're really sweating. Otherwise, drink water. Water is so beneficial to you. Just keep staying hydrated. And the other thing is if you're a wrestler, water's going to come off so easy right. and so fast, so easily and fast. It's gonna You're going to float it off a lot easier, and then also you're going to sweat it out a lot easier. Were you pulling pretty hard to make your weight in college? Um, I started to my... Trying to think, my junior year is when a 1997, be the 96, 97 year, uh, is when there was three three deaths in the sport of wrestling, and they changed the weights during the middle of the season. So it went from I was wrestling 134 pounds. That's what it says on my plaque that year from nationals, my junior year. But after Christmas, going in the Midlands because we just had some deaths um, due to weight cutting, um, they moved all the weight classes up seven pounds. So I went from wrestling 134 to 141. But they also did it to where it was a two-hour weigh-in, too. Mm. So um, it was like seven hours, It was right? like six, seven hours, yeah. you know, and plastics were allowed, saunas were allowed, all that was allowed. Um, so, But you had a lot more time. You could cut a lot more weight because you had a lot more time to recover. Mm -hmm. So you put it down to a two-hour weigh-in, and you didn't have near the amount of time. So they gave everybody a seven-pound weight allowance, but they, but they made it a two-hour weigh-in, and then they took away plastics and took away saunas. Um, they didn't really know what they were going to do that year for sure, but that's just kind of what they moved to immediately, took course of action because um, things weren't obviously being done right. And so even on my plaque that year, I guess, like I said, it says 134, one, um, but it was technically we weighed in at 141 that year. And it's gotten a lot better, don't you think? Uh, much better, a absolutely. Um, I think like what you said, the science behind it, they're a lot more knowledgeable. Uh, one-hour weigh-ins, you can't cheat yourself on a one-hour weigh-in these days. You just you can't do it. And that's what's awesome. I, I, I'm a firm believer in the one-hour weigh-in. I think it's, it, it's awesome at the high school level, at the college level, and it really makes you – concentrate on your nutrition on your diet and making sure you're not going bouncing up and down in weight and you're staying kind of leveled out um, and you're getting in a good good routine uh, because one hour i mean that's not a whole lot of time to recover you have to go into that weigh-in feeling <clears throat> basically decent right then and there because you're not going to be able to replenish yourself especially if you're a 125 pounder which the lighter weights tend to cut a little bit more weight than the upper weights just ironic isn't yeah. it yeah <laughs> so and then typically you start at 125 pounds so they really have to have it under control um you know w when they weigh in and when they go out of the max typically they're the first out yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's the black eye of wrestling, but people perform better when they're not cutting, right? So why not get rid of it altogether if possible? And that's that's the thing about high school. And what I see now in high school um, is, is all the time is the fact that these kids are just the, – the coaches are having to cut so much weight and on one-hour weigh-ins, and the kids aren't eating at all during the day of school at all. Like, they can't eat. And then they got to try and get a little quick workout in before they go weigh in. And it's like, go up a weight. Right. Go up a weight – Go into practice. Don't have your sweats and sweatpants and everything on. Go in there with the, you could maybe for a warm up just to get your sweat going. Shed it. Re practice every day in a t shirt and shorts. Think about wrestling. Think about your skills. Think about what you're doing. You're going to practice to get better at wrestling. You're not going to practice to for weight management and to cut weight and go up a weight, feel good. And especially at that level, allow your body to grow a little bit. You're going to get so much more out of the sport and have so much more fun in the sport. If you're not pulling all that weight and concentrating on weight all the time, it's going to be very beneficial for them, for someone to go up um, and, and wrestle at a higher level, a sure. higher weight class. Absolutely. And, but the reality is that back in your day, that was just kind of coming around. So guys, we're still pulling and, Sometimes that season can get long, right? In 97, you talked about Gable, you know, Oklahoma State had beat you guys at the duels, the Big Tens. You guys won, but it kind of went 50-50. Gable's trying to get everyone remotivated for 97. One story I love is on the bus ride from here to you and I, Gable's reading the newspaper 
that Oklahoma State's already been like given this? Is it true that he was reading the paper on the charter bus up trying to get everyone going? I was three seats behind him <laughs> on the opposite side. I was watching him read the paper. And so, yes, it is a very true story. It was it absolutely Des Moines Register, and he was reading it on the way up, and, and he got so – uh, kind of riled up during it, which he could have been putting it on too. He could have read it earlier that morning, for all I know, it, yeah. and, and then pretend like he was just reading it. And like, oh my God, listen, I can't even believe this. Listen to this, guys. Guys, listen to this. And he started reading the article and was like, can you believe that they're basically already handing him the trophy? And you know, it worked. It, it really worked. And we put on a, uh, a display that year that was second to none, and it's still we still hold the record today. Um, and it was just, you know, it's like a Cinderella story to put Gable out basically almost in his hometown right there in Cedar Falls, set the record. Um, you know, like you mentioned, two weeks before that in the Big Ten finals, I think we had six Big Ten finalists and only two champs. McRave and I were, were the only two Big Ten champions. We go to Nationals, we put six in the finals again at the Nationals with five champs. How do you go from having two Big Ten champs to having five NCAA <laughs> champs in two weeks? You know, it's just that's where Gable was so absolutely amazing um, in his coaching styles and philosophies and the way that he could work guys, not just peaking them at the right time physically, but also mentally. And he, he, he was just really, really, really good at it. And then at one point that tournament, early Friday, I think, John Smith, and I'm one of the biggest John Smith fans there is, someone asked him about all the bonus points, and he called it play points. And I heard that Gable used that as well, that uh, – you know, John Smith saying all the bonus points are play points, but obviously at the Nationals, that's everything. You yeah, know? he. Uh, I don't remember exactly what Gable said, but I do remember him talking about it in our pre-meeting at the hotel room before we went over the next morning about just being play points um, and about how those those points add up. Keep going out there doing our job and keep getting those play points, you know, basically. So um, those play points is what allowed us to set the record and, and be as dominant as that we were. But the craziest thing is what people don't realize is that and now think about this. In the national tournament, we went we won as a team 24 matches straight <laughs> as a team without losing. 24 matches straight. Can you imagine going to the tournament and watching your team win 24 matches straight without anybody losing? That's just insane. It's just something kind of like you know what you're talking about right now. What's going on with these guys in the eye wrestling right now? There's yeah. just the the the, the close knit, um, you know, the, the the camaraderie amongst these guys, and they're just feeding off each other. I remember um, during that tournament, hopping into the van. Uh, we we didn't stay and watch everybody wrestle. You get four or five guys that they're kind of done. You throw them in the van. We we drive them back to Waverly where our hotel was, and we're listening to it on the radio. We're following the guys, but it's like everybody was individually doing their their job, so to speak, but yet at the same time, we were doing it together. It's kind of really kind of hard to explain, um, but just the, and, and not just the athletes either, but the coaches, you know, from from Coach Brands, the Brands's to Jimmy Zleski to Coach Gable. I mean, everybody was just, it was on to the next guy, next guy, next, next man in, next man in, here, here we go. And it was just, it was just something that the ball got rolling in the right direction thanks to Casey Gillis starting us off with a huge fall um, over uh, Maldonado from Iowa State, just absolutely erupted the crowd, got us going, and it was just, look out, we just went like gangbusters from there on out. Well, and it's like, you know, when you look at all those all those bonus points and the fact that Iowa going into it was number two is even more. People forget that they weren't number one going in. It wasn't a shoe in It was an upset. And, in fact, Bob Siddons, Gable's coach, was th the guy to hand out the first-place trophy. Or, excuse me, the second-place trophy. Like, before the tournament started, Siddons, you're handing out the second-place trophy because they thought Iowa was going to get second. And he was going to give it to Gable. Friday night, they go, Siddons, you're presenting the first-place trophy because Iowa just locked this thing up. It's like that's the cool part about it is the upset. Um, that's why you wrestle them. Right. That's why when everybody says right now I was a lock for the Nationals, they are so far from the truth. There is no such thing as a lock. You know, that's why you go and you play the game or you wrestle the matches because you just never, you never, ever know, especially when it comes to the Hawks because you can't count the Hawks out. Never. And last thing I want to ask you, Mr. Ironside, is we're in your, your office here, we're in your building. You own a, a business, obviously, a small business owner. What – how did you get into this business? And two, obviously, how did wrestling or what values from wrestling help you day to day, you know, running a business, being a salesperson, that, that kind of thing? Um, well, I actually kind of own two two types of businesses right now. Where we're at right now is Ironside Apparel and Promotions. So this is the custom side of the business to where, like, you want shirts for um, wrestling changed my life. 
then we can make you shirts for wrestling change your life. That's mm-hmm. the custom. Everything's custom made. And then the other side of the business is the retail side of the business where it's about three miles from here. It's a retail store to where, you know, a lot of people know it. it's called Iowa style apparel. Um, and that's where all of our Hawkeye gear is at. And then the, even this last year, I licensed, and now we have Iowa State gear in there. We have UNI gear in there. We have a couple local high school gears type stuff in there. We have wrestling shoes, head gears, like equipment type stuff like that. That's the retail side of the business. So it's kind of like two businesses that we have. How I got into it was um, uh, in 2001, I, became, I had an opportunity to become a sales rep for another company in this lo- custom line of business. So... Um, I was like, cool. You know, everybody needs shirts. That's one good thing about this business that they'll never change is everybody wants unique custom type shirts. And, you Mm -hmm. know, we have to, you know, have clothing to cover our bodies. So um, with that being said, it's something that's never going to kind of fade in or fade out. Everybody's going to always need type of clothing. Um, So I was like, yeah, that's cool. And I know a lot of people have a lot of resources. Like, yeah, I'll give it a try or whatever. And I really enjoyed it. And just talking to different people kind of, I like the flexibility being on my own at the time. Um, You know, I was just, that's kind of how I, how I was raised and just, I just wanted to kind of run my own thing or whatever. And after being in the business for like five and a half years as a salesperson, I decided to kind of cut it loose and go out on my own. I I was like, just, I can do this on my own and obviously make more money, uh, be more in charge. I wanted to do things a little bit differently than the way they were doing the business where I was at. So honestly, I just um, went and started out of my basement and I was in my basement um, for a year and a half and I was doing everything on my own. Um, um, I did end up hiring uh, an accountant to handle the tax um, taxes and stuff like that, that type of stuff, you know. But yeah, my garage, you know, uh, was full of tables with clothing all over them and I'm in packaging and doing everything myself. There wasn't anything I didn't do. I did everything from... Um, everything from start to finish all by myself. And then after <clears throat> a year and a half of being in the basement, um, my wife kicked me out and said that we just needed, you needed to go find a bigger place because our house is kind of being overrun. I like my garage back and so forth, which I agreed. Um, and plus it just, I didn't want to be homey. I wanted to get out in a way. So then I went and got a warehouse, which was only like a mile from my house. And we just opened up a warehouse. And then at that point in time, I hired a, a full-time office manager, um, that had already been in the business and was at the company that I was at before. So she knew me, I knew her, she knew the industry. Um, so she was able to handle a lot of the accounting aspect of it, the ordering process of it and so forth. So I could concentrate more on sales, what I wanted to, which was the aspect of the business was sales. Yeah. Um, so we were there for three years um, <clears throat> and the business just kept growing and growing and getting bigger and bigger. And um, so then where we're at now, I bought this lot and I built this building in 2011, hired, you know, just slowly over time. What are we now? 2020. Um, you know, I went from just owning it myself in my basement to where now I have, I think, 13 full time employees, um, which isn't a huge business, still small businesses. But um, I pretty much still do everything behind the scenes. I try to handle and try to be in on um, you, know, you can't be on every sale, but I try to be in on like know what's going on all the time. I'm here every day. I'm the first one in. Um, every single day and it, it's a lot it's a lot of work I mean people just see that they, they see that your names on the on the sign out front and they just think that you got it made and people have no idea what it takes to run a small business but with that being said going back to your question you know how did wrestling help me get to here um, in, in so many different aspects of that sport so many different aspects of that sport has put me in the position that I am in my life now and um, I'm very grateful for the sport of wrestling and what it gave me. Um, I'm very grateful for my my parents for the upbringing, the, how they raised me. Um, They're very very hard on us um, for the right reasons. And as any kid, when you're growing up, you um, you think that the, they're all just completely against you and they don't like <laughs> you and that they don't know what they're talking about. But when once you look back, um, I was very lucky to have them them raise us the way that we did. My brother and my sister and I raised us the way that we did. But um, the, the amount of dedication it takes to be a competitive wrestler and to be good at and to be successful, um, you know, in the room, out of the room. There's so many different fa- facets of wrestling that that goes into be to be successful. And we've we've hit on some of them. You know, you've got your you've got your nutrition, which is an enormous amount of it. And that's the other thing about wrestling versus other sports too. Nobody, other people don't really have to worry about cutting weight and really, really 
you know, concentrate on nutrition, like what wrestling does. You, you have to be so focused on that. But then you also have your conditioning factor, both cardio and also in the weight room, you know, conditioning. And then you have your skill sets. Not only that, and, and when I'm talking about skill sets, I'm not just going in the room and work on your feet. You've got your feet. You've got, you know, right-handed shots, left-handed shots, head of the inside shots, head of the outside shots, and it's endless. And you never stop learning in there. And then you got the bottom position. You got the top position. Um, there's just, then you got your social life that you have to balance. Then you got your girlfriends. And I mean, it's just, you, there's so many things. You got your studies your academics. I mean, there's so many things that you have to balance and that you have to decide and, and start prioritizing them. Like what's most important to be successful. And that is where wrestling has really probably benefited me the most is giving me the dedication to be able to stay disciplined on a regular daily basis and not get sidetracked with outside sources of things and to stay to kind of stay the course and and the, I, i'm very blessed too to still be able to do the i wrestling radio the commentary for them follow with them so i still get to see it i still get to be involved in it and a lot and when i'm with that i see that and it reminds me of things over and over and over again i'm still benefiting from wrestling all the time and uh you know and, and it's something that too it's you know you, you could go on and on and uh, we got to end this sooner. People are going to get bored. But, you know, wrestling has benefited me f to be from being a boss here to my employees. I treat it like it's like a team atmosphere. I'm not like rah, rah, you know, our team's going to, you know, but knowing how to manage the employees, knowing kind of how to talk to them and, and motivate them and bring them along and, and do it in a manner where um, you're, 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 teaching them something but you're doing it in a positive manner it's not coming across them in a negative aspect and it's the same thing with with my own daughters and my and my kids you know and the fact that they're in sports now and they're in school and and trying to motivate them and seeing a lot of stuff that they're going through where they think something might be really really important but yeah it's really not or things that they might not see the important but hey that's what you need to be concentrating on um sometimes when it's your own kids it's a little bit tougher um but also you know it's just it just there's so many different things that wrestling you never stop uh, learning from the sport. And that's why I enjoy being around it. I enjoy still doing camps and clinics all over the country. I still like to go and do motivational talks, speaking engagements, even for businesses and stuff like that. And I get a kick out of it because it reminds you of where you started at and what got you to here. And not only what got you to here, I don't want to say that, oh, I made it by no means. I got a long, long, long ways to go. And that's the awesome thing about Dan Gable is every time I see him almost, he's always asking, hey, how's that business going? What are you doing to grow it? Yep. You know, where are you at? Is, are you still getting bigger? Are you still growing it? Are things going good there? It's like, he, he doesn't say, hey, good job. I see you got your own business. Good job. It's like, you know, you're, you know, go back to the Kerry Colat thing. You know, one thing I just thought of is the day after that Colat match, you know, the biggest match in my career, I'm, you know, I just beat Kerry Colat. I'm sitting up in the top bleachers and uh, just loving life. And, and he's going through the entire, um, our squad that day that was in the, 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 the all-star meet the night before, which I think there was like six of us, you know, there was Mike Mena. There was Jeff McGinnis, and then there was me. And he was talking to Mike, talked about Mike Men and his match, and he talked about Jeff McGinnis and his match. And then he comes to me, and I'm just sitting up there, and I just chest puffed out. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, Dan Gable's going to praise me. It's like, this is awesome. You know, I just beat Kerry Cola. And it's like, Ironside, and he points right at me and says, good job. Zadik, and he goes <laughs> right on to Bill Zadik. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's it? But it only took like two seconds, and I realized, hey, that match is over. You know, we got a lot of work to do. We got to continue to keep growing. We got to, you know, we got to get a lot better. We got a lot more matches coming up. We got Big Tens coming up. We got Nationals coming up. That wasn't the the, the defined match of the season. So, um, good job. But now we're moving on. Onward. And, and, and onward, absolutely. And that was that was kind of like a defining moment in my life. And that taught me a lot right then and there and made me um, realize some things there too. So I love it. That's yeah. a great way to, to wind it down. Usually we ask how to rest and change your life. You already answered that. Prediction on Penn State, Iowa. It's tomorrow night, biggest duel of the year. Everyone can't wait. What do you think? I'm thinking uh, I kind of penciled it out roughly yesterday. Um, I do not see us losing this meet. I do not see that at all. Even if Let's even go. even if uh, things go as south as they possibly could for us, I do not see us losing it. Uh, I penciled it out. I think um, I have it as um, 23 to nine Hawks. Um, <sighs> right, right there. So 23 nine Hawks is what I'm what I'm going for. There it is. Mark so, Ironside, thank you so much for your time, sir. It's yep, been an honor. Yep. Pleasure. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a review, give us a rating, and share this with your friends. It would mean the world to us. Thanks for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life.